Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the church and society in our continuing study of biblical ethics. If we look at a short survey of church history, and of course we could go into much more depth than this, we have the early church around 30 to 33 AD uh, being born. Uh, then in around the year 312, we have Constantine and what we could call the Roman church, where suddenly, for the first time, Christianity is, is officially legal. Now the next step is 1054. Um, we're not going to focus too much on that, but there's a schism between the church in the west and the church in the east, uh, and that's going to uh, have big impact on both of those aspects of the church. And then the final division is going to be 1517, um, the beginning of the Reformation, Martin Luther and others that would follow him. Now, we have the conversionist church, in, in that early period, the church looked at itself and it saw it, a distinction. There was the church, there was the world, and sort of never the twain shall meet. At least that, you know, you don't see too much influence going one way or the other. Um, uh, you had the church, you had believers being, con uh, people being converted into the church, but the, the world was not substantially changed by the church in those earlier, in those early years until until we have the coming of Constantine. So beginning around 312, we have the Christianity now becomes legal, and now the church begins to transform the world, and unfortunately, to some degree, the, the world also begins to transform the church. It, it actually goes in both directions. Next, we have a uh, event taking place where, and it's, it, you know, it's not really that it begins in 1054, uh, but I'm just using that as a, conv a convenient marker where, because this actually began all the way back with, uh, with Constantine, but the world and the church uh, begin to get very much alike. Uh, we could call this the accommodation church, where the church accommodates itself to the society in which it f finds itself. And, of course, the church had already uh, brought about major changes to that society, so it had gone both ways. But now, during this period, we see the church being changed much more than the world being changed. And finally, finally, we come to the what we could call the transforming church. This is uh, the Reformation, where where the church is seeking to transform the world. This is the the work of the reformers. And yet, there were also those uh, that still have this idea of uh, converting, um, and also approaching it from the point of view of no, the world is the world, and the church is the church, and let's make sure there's a division between those two, sort of a, a separation of church and state. And this brings up the question, should the church be involved? Should religion uh, clash with or, or have an involvement with politics? Is there a right way or a wrong way to do that? The Anabaptists, the Anabaptists, in, and, and you see them around the time of the Reformation, uh, they're sort of a, um, if I can call them, they're not revolting, but they're sort of a, a, a splitter group that says, um, this idea of trying to change the world, you know, we need to, you know, there's God's realm, and then there's the world, and, and the church is really supposed to be an antithesis to the world. That, again, that sort of idea, never the twain shall meet. Uh, they saw themselves separating from prevailing culture. Uh, yes, they would have liked to have changed culture, but, but that's not really their big emphasis. Um, and it's paralleled in the first century, actually even before the first century, by a Jewish group called the Essenes. Um, actually, the, the Essenes go back uh, much earlier than the first century. They were a Jewish group. Uh, uh, at least some of them were located there by the shores of the Dead Sea at Qumran. Uh, they were the folks that gave us the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and they had gone down to that area to be separate and distinct, not just from pagans, but even from other Christians like the ones in Jerusalem, or from other Jewish people like the ones in Jerusalem. Now, uh, I'm going to put all these together. We so we have the Antithesis Church that has a separation. We have the Conversionist Church that, notice there's still sort of a separation, but it sees that, that you know, all of, you know, both church and the world uh, exist in God's realm. And the business of the church is to convert people from the world to the church. Now, they're still in the world, but they're not of the world. 
Next, we have the transforming church that, uh, in, in its best day, is, is changing the world. And that's a good thing, um, as long as the church isn't get, getting changed by it. But sometimes that can, that can turn into what we could call the accommodation church, where the church begins to conform to the world. Now, it's one thing if it's conforming in, in non-essentials. For example, um, you know, missionaries go to a, a foreign land and they learn the language of that foreign land and maybe they adopt some of the cultures, not, culture, not aspects of the culture that are sinful, but aspects of this culture that allows them to better communicate. And that's an accommodation church too, and that's a, a positive example of that sort of accommodation. We have two great calls in the scripture. One is the Great Commission, and the other is what has been called the cultural mandate. The Great Commission, the Great Commission is seen in Matthew chapter 28, beginning verse 18, where Jesus came up and spoke to them, that is his, his apostles, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, uh, that's actually a participle, going therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, another participle, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you, always even to the end of the age. And, and Matthew's gospel account actually ends on that note, with that call to go and make disciples. And of course, the way you, you make disciples is you're going and you're baptizing and you're teaching. But notice the Great Commission involves making disciples, uh, making those who will be other uh, worshipers of God, those that will trust in him and seek to follow him. As opposed to that, as opposed to that, the cultural mandate given way back in, in the first chapter of Genesis where uh, God made a man male and female and he blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And the idea of the cultural mandate is that we are called to rule on behalf of the Lord, to subdue, to make the world that which is obedient to God. And notice these two ideas are not necessarily mutually exclusive. The cultural mandate uh, is a mandate to rule the world as representatives of God. The Great Commission is a commission to go into all the world and make disciples. And if all the world are disciples, then they're going to be ruling as representatives of God. And if they're ruling as the representatives of God, then perhaps you could say, well, the best way to do that is to be disciples. So I, there, I think there is a crossover between these two. The cultural mandate uh, commands a fruitful multiplication. The Great Commission commands a fruitful multiplication, uh, where disciples are to be multiplied. The cultural mandate is based upon a delegated authority conferred to those made in the image of God. You know, the, the, uh, mankind is made in God's image. That's Genesis chapters uh, 1, verses 26 and 27. And on the basis of that, uh, he is told, go, man, mankind is, is told, go and rule. The Great Commission also is based upon a delegated authority to those who are joined to Christ, to whom has been given all authority. And now he, he delegates, he deputizes his followers to go and make disciples. We fulfill the cultural mandate today primarily through the making disciples of the nations. And that involves bringing the rule of Christ to the entire world. Now, unfortunately, sometimes the way Christians do that isn't, isn't perhaps at the best. I, here's a bumper sticker, and uh, you ought to be aware of bumper sticker theology, but notice it says, be nice to America or we'll bring democracy to your country. Um, or here's another one, another example. Uh, God is angry, and then, you know, the things about which he's angry, homosexuality and abortion and Democrats. Uh, uh, and, and I think that maybe some of these areas uh, can have some, some issues with them. Uh, we're talking about uh, in, other, in other lectures about the issue of, of sexuality and the issue of abortion. I'm not, I don't have one in t uh, for Democrats, because if I did, I'd also have to have one for Republicans. Um, but it calls us to perhaps take a, an attitude where we are more winsome in our desire to be holy and to make holy disciples. James chapter 1, verse 5 says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And although the passage is talking about wisdom in the face of suffering, 
I think perhaps that the the message of this verse can be applicable also to those situations in how we deal with the world, how we make disciples of the nations, how we bring God's rule first in our lives, but then in our world as well.